Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome again to our Open Office Hour series for NetSuite. Uh, the topic today is roles, permissions, and security. My name is Alejandro Alvarez. I'm a senior manager with Crow, and I'll be guiding us through this process today. Uh, as always, we will be recording this and posting it to our YouTube channel and sharing the link with you later if you want to share it with your colleagues. Um, let's get started. Um, I'm going to switch over to my system. And we're, we'll start with a high-level overview of you know, permissions, roles, security, and, and then we will go through the questions that we received beforehand or any questions that we received during the demo today. So in order to be able to manage roles, you have to have an administrator or administrator-like role. It could be a custom role. I'm not good as an administrator. And uh, I'm going to go to where we set up um, the, the roles uh, first. Uh, and then I'll go into a couple of features. Actually, let me go into the features first of things that you can set up. And then we'll go to the roles so that we can see them there in action. Um, there's a few different uh, features that your account comes with. And this is available for all NetSuite accounts. That, um, that you can enable or disable based on your requirements for additional security. And, and then you have to obviously configure them in, in the roles that you want to uh, adapt to those security roles. So if you go to enable features under Suite Cloud, this is where you have all these features. Um, and some of, some of the features will be dependent on other features like custom records or scripts or, or flows, uh, Suite Flow. But the ones that are that we want to concentrate on is you have a set of features for um, authentication that are additional optional features that you can enable. There's four uh, options for single sign-on. The first one is you know if you want to use NetSuite as an authentication mechanism to sign into other applications. There's OpenID to enable the Google authentication mechanism. There's OpenID Connect. And then you have the SML, SAML single sign-on, which is typically used by you know, Microsoft Active Directory, Azure of, of systems. So depending on which one you want to use, you can use one or more of these, depending on how many systems you're connecting with um, or you want to use for authentication. Besides those four options, you also have the option of doing token-based authentication. And then you have the auth 2.0, which is used for integration. So we'll get into how these are configured in the in the in the user roles. We won't necessarily get into full integration. So I know that there's a couple of questions about integration and using your auth doing the integration. It's a little bit more advanced than today's session. But if you have any specific questions or you need some support, there you can always reach our support line for that. So once you have enabled these features, then you know you'll see them available uh, under under the roles. Uh, so we'll go there first and, and we'll just go through each of these different options here so that you, you're familiar with them. Um, the first one is you know, basically uh, manage, uh, manage users where you can see all the users by role. So when you're doing your audit, and who's available, who has access, these are the users that are in the system, um, the user, their email and what roles they have access to. So, and you can filter here by role if you want to see well, who has administrator role. Then you can see all the people in this system that have administrator, administrator role. And based on that, you can, you, you can go to those employees and remove or change those roles as, as necessary. The next option here is obviously the, the option of managing roles. Uh, before I get there, I'm just going to go here to sh show role differences. This is also when you have multiple roles that you customize over time, you wanna consolidate them. You have this option, this out of the box next to the option where you can define a role and you can compare it to another role. So I have a mid-market account analyst role. They say I wanna com com compare it to this FMMM account analyst role. So I can, uh, I can select which ones I wanna compare and I can say, show me everything, compare every option or only show me the role differences. And when I click show, it's going to show me a list of the differences, you know, what differences I have. And it could be roles that I have no access to or, you know, a different permission level from none all the way to, 
to full permission. So that's very useful and you can download this if you're doing some, some sort of audit analysis or any type of analysis. Uh, let's move on to the uh, managed role. So whenever uh, you get NetSuite, uh, you, the NetSuite comes free uh, with uh, some um, out of the box roles, standard roles. And depending on whether you have a Swift success or non Swift success version, you'll get the standard roles that come with the system, and then you'll come with the, you'll have the the customized roles that come with Swift success, uh, which um, ha are optimized for for the Swift success processes. So in this and in in this account, you know, I have a, a lot of roles. I have sixty four roles, here. Um, but you can see that you know roles are going to be the out of the box roles that come with NetSuite are going to be, uh, on, will only have the option to be customized. Those roles cannot be um, edited to create a copy of that role basically. And then you have every other role, you know, will have the option to edit that role um, uh, accordingly. There's best practices, for example, for those some roles that you can edit the, the three success roles to not edit them, and, but to create a copy of those roles. And so that you, you can, you know, they can be updated by the um, by the bundles as they get updated. So those are perspectives you can follow. Um, so I'm going to go to any role here. I'm going to go to just this, this mid market account AP analyst role. Now let me go to the account accounting analyst role. And when you get to the role, uh, you open a role. You know, you know, we'll go through the different options that you have here. Uh, you know, every role should have a unique name. You can give it a unique ID and change that unique ID. We recommend that you always follow direct uh, nomenclature. If not, that's we'll just give it a number uh, uh, after this custom role uh, tag. The, every role will have an account or sorry, a center type. And we talked about center types when we talked about dashboards. And a center type is basically the way the net is organized for the different menu and, and kind of options here. Uh, and it's optimized into you know, accounting center, classic center, sales center. So once a, a center type is defined in a role and that role is saved, you cannot change that center type. If you were to create a new role from scratch, for example, if I'm here and I'm creating a new role, you'll have the option of, you know, of selecting the center type at that time that, that'll drive, you know, what center types. And you'll see that the center types are standard in NetSuite. And it goes, goes from accounting to partner center, executive center types, you know, depends on the role that you're trying to um, create. Typically, we don't see a lot of users uh, creating a role from scratch. Uh, of the, um, you know, you have to start with every, every feature, every list, every permission. We see uh, the majority of the customers and even our projects will start with the standard role and they will modify it uh, because it already has a lot of the, the requirements or, or required permissions uh, in the role. So let me go back to the accounting analyst role. As you navigate through the role, you know, you'll see uh, different options first. The first is employee restrictions. So this will allow you to define whether that specific role has the permission to look at, at employee information in the system, other employee information, and you can define it to uh, um, to none, to own, subordinate, and unassigned. Basically, uh, if, if it's an employee that has no supervisor in the employee record, uh, just or to my team or my team subordinates, and or own, own and subordinates only, which is basically people that I uh, have uh, where I am indicated as a supervisor for those people in the employee in the employee record. Uh, once you select something, you have the option of being able to allow viewing of other records for that specific role, or just, you know, that means that they can view records for, from other employees that are not in that list uh, or does, don't fit this criteria, but they would not be able to do any edit, even if they have the permissions under here uh, to, to edit uh, information on those records. Um, then you have other things, for example, uh, the not restrict employee fields is, I mean, in every, every field has information here, but this is where you wanna use 
um, if you want to, if you're in a sales cycle or sales role, if you want to select an employee that's not under your, or be able to change the record of an employee that is not under your supervision. Uh, restricting time and expenses. Also, if you want to just restrict employees to just do time and expenses in the system, a uh, sales role is used for specifically for for roles in the sales organization. Again, only to be able to view uh, not only the employee and, and the transactions for your team, but also to be able to view and manage quotas, forecast only for your team. Right? It restricts that to your team only. Uh, Support role is going to be checked if you are in a support role, if you're doing cases, for example, if you have that option on the, on the, the CRM functionality, so that you can restrict also the same way. If you're a supervisor of a team of support representatives, you can view cases, you can reassign cases for your team, but you cannot touch somebody else's uh, team. Uh, partner role are for the partner center. If you're a partner role, you want to make sure you check this so the Partners that have access to NetSuite via the Partner Center can, can see information in that Partner Center and only information for where they are marked as partners. And then, of course, you have the option of, of you know, uh, marking a, a role inactive so they cannot be selected for future um, employees. This doesn't inactivate the role in the employee record. You still have to go in and change it, but it inactivates that, the selection of that role going forward. Then once you select all that, you have the option of selecting subsidiary restrictions. This has changed the way it's set up in the last couple of, uh, I think two releases ago. It used to be, uh, the look and feel used to be different. Uh, now they've made it a little bit easier, where if you have uh, um, one world and multiple subsidiaries, uh, you can set up the restrictions for that specific role here. And the, the, the options are gonna be whether they they can you know, look at all subsidiaries that are in the system, whether they can look at all active subsidiaries. So if there's an active, they won't be able to see information for those anymore. The user subsidiaries, the user is a subsidiary marked in the employee record. So only that subsidiary, that employee that has this role would be, would be assigned to it. So if you have a, a, an accounting analyst role, and you have three employees in different subsidiaries. If you use this, they could use the same role, but only look at information in their own subsidiary. Or you can use a selection here where you, you click select it. You can say, well, it's not all or one, but it's two subsidiaries that this record can, can view, this role can view, Canada and the US. So if you have a sort of a shared back office across subsidiaries, then this role could, whoever has assigned this role could look at information for both subsidiaries. And you also can check where they can view records for other subsidiaries, but they cannot create, edit, or delete record for the subsidiaries that, that are not selected in this, in this option. Um, going back to authentication, this is where you have the option of setting up the rules for this specific role as far as authentication. Um, if you have single sign-on functionality, you can set up a role that can only sign on through single sign-on, meaning that they cannot go to netsuite.com and enter their username and password. You can give that restriction, which obviously restricts them from being able to enter NetSuite if they're not within your authentication uh, mechanism, right? So it gives you that extra level of security. Um, if you don't click that, they can still access through single sign-on, but they can enter NetSuite or access NetSuite through their uh, username and password credentials as, as normal. If this is a web services only role, you create a role only for an integration, you, you, you still have to give that role the permissions it needs as if it were a user to create or modify records uh, or view records even, but you can mark this role as web services, which means that this role cannot be used as a user through the user interface. Um, there's an option for restricting the role by device ID. This is used for specifically for suite commerce in store and suite commerce uh, uh, in, in store solution for you know, retail. Um, if you have, you want to restrict the user to only be able to access a specific device ID, and the device ID is going to be, you know, very, it has to be configured in the system which device IDs uh, 
you can access uh, to, so it restricts you to a specific machine. Um, use of point of sale type uh, systems. And then you have the two-factor authentication required role or, or per, uh, uh, setting, whether you define whether this, this role requires two-factor authentication or not. Uh, as you know, some roles like an administrator role uh, required it by default in the system, but the, the custom roles and the non-administrator roles, you can define that they still need the two-factor authentication. And you can also select for that role how long the, the, uh, the duration of the trusted device uh, uh, works. And, and if you're familiar with that, when you use two-factor authentication, it tells you, you know, do you want me to remember this device for X number of time? And you can define for roles. So if you have a role that you trust, you can say up to 30 days. But if you have people to, to check it every day, then you can say, you know, one day. So for that whole day, every time they log in, they don't have to do the 2FA. But if you want them to do it every day, they would have to, to do it every day, right? Um, pure self-explanatory here. Um, so once you get that, then you're going to go into the different things that you can set up in a role. Um, and I'm going to go through this, you know, uh, kind of fast, but you have the option of, you know, selecting what, what transactions a specific role can, can view or work on. So there's a, a long list of the transactions that you have access to depending on the, 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 depending on the modules that you have enabled in your account. Uh, just you define the, the, the transaction type. And then you can define a level of either view, create, edit, or full. And obviously, view is just viewing the record. The person will not have the edit button. Create will allow you to create the record. So hit new and create, but will not allow you to edit that button. So if you want people to just create it but not change them, they won't have that edit button either. Uh, edit means that you can view, create, and change a record. And full means that you can delete it. Um, we generally recommend against the full uh, permission, uh, except for certain roles. Um, even though there is a a way to track that transactions have been deleted in the system, and, and 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 you can report on that, it's obviously always a risk if you have the option to to delete. Right. So uh, we recommend that that is limited. Uh, then you can also assign restrictions about reports. And we talked about reports a, a couple of sessions ago, uh, where you can give specific roles permission to a report um, when you create a report. But this allows them to actually see if they can even look at the report. So there has to be uh, congruence between the report and the role, uh, because the report itself would not exclude a role that doesn't have permission to it in the drop down. It will show all roles. So if you select a role that doesn't have access to a specific permission uh, report here, they won't be able to see it even if you share it with them. So you have to be make sure that they have access to the report and then obviously have that report shared with them. And again, the, the uh, most permissions for reports are gonna be view only because you restrict the, the editing of those reports on the permission level. Lists are gonna be sort of your setup lists and uh, so uh, our, our input data. So Customers, vendors, records, uh, you know, employees, chart of accounts, accounting list, terms. So all those are lists uh, that are not used in transactions, you know, list records. And again, you can se select the list that you want to give somebody permission to. And, you know, the permission is going to be the same, view all the way to full. If you want to give somebody permission to set up activities, then you would do it here. So, for example, Terms is an accounting list. Um, it's, it's under accounting list in, in the NetSuite setup screen. So here in the setup menu here. So if you want to give somebody permission to be able to view at that level, not on the transaction, but at the level of, of being able to view the core list, you're going to have to give them permission here. And, you know, and it goes all the way from being able to create a custom record type to being something seeing something that's standard like an accounting list. Uh, under setup is where you also can find uh, employees, uh, whether they have uh, uh, web services access 
or where they have or they use two-factor authentication so you still have to set, set that up even your they're setting this here or they're set, setting that up here or you know things like OAuth for that specific role you, this is where you will set up all those set up permissions so that they can actually you know access you use those features and all of that is very detailed on on Sweet Answers. So if you need more information or you can contact us. Um, finally, you have custom records where you can define permission to a custom record here uh, and give them access to that custom record or when you create a custom record, you have the option under the custom record to, to provide permissions there. And within the custom record, it actually asks you as a setting whether to use this permissions list or the permissions list within the custom record itself. So you have options there. It's always nice to get you a couple of ways of, of, of doing the same thing. Um, so this is uh, sort of the, all the permissions and how you set up. Obviously you have to understand or know what you want to give the, the employee permissions to, but this is where you would, you would achieve that once you know exactly what you want them to access and change. Um, under restrictions is where you can restrict an employee to, to what they can uh, edit. Uh, based on the on another subsidiary here, but where you can use the other uh, segments of NetSuite. So if you want to restrict a role, for example, this account analyst role, to only be able to change the class, or however you've renamed that segment in NetSuite, uh, to be able to to have um, a certain restriction only to their own class in their employee record, or you know any that class and any child class of that specific class when you can have hierarchies of classes or, or any record that is not assigned a class um, or transaction that's not assigned a class. And the same thing with subordinates. So this is where you would define whether somebody, you know, what level of permission they get for specific transaction. So you, depending on how you're organized, you may want only accountants that are working one specific line of business for your business. So you may want to well, you can only access records for, or edit records or create records for that specific class, you'll never see that other class when you do the drop down, right? Um, so you define it here, and again, you can then select whether they can view all the records, but not change them. And then you have the option of, you know, on the item record, you have the option of selecting the class, the department, and the location of the item. So you can define this as well here, uh, if you want them to, to that permission to be assigned to the item record itself. Um, and you can only set this up once. So if I try to enter the class again here, another permission here is going to tell me that I already have a class that would be expected. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's selected for you know only one segment. One thing that we've been asked in the past, and it's not possible unless you do a workflow, is what if you have you know classes that are not related? Let's say you have five classes in your system and you wanna give an employee permission to two out of those five classes, but there's no parent-child relationship on those, uh, that is not possible unless you do a workflow because you can't, just like we do with, with, with subsidiaries here, there's not an option to multi-select what classes an employee has permissions to. It's possible that NetSuite will develop that in the future, uh, but that has, you know, they, they have not done so yet or given any indication when that will be available, if any. So. Uh, note that, that 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 is a restriction that cannot be uh, accomplished. Um, next thing in the role is you can define whether an employee has access to specific forms or not. Um, and you know if they, if it's not enabled for that role, then an employee will not be able to use specific forms. And where this this comes handy is that you can create multiple forms for the same record or transaction, but hide fields that you want unaccessible. And an example is an employee form. So you may be able to create an employee form where you have the salary of that employee, but you wanna have that form only available for the CFO, for example, and another form that's accessible for the you know, accounting analyst uh, that doesn't show the, the salary of the employee, right? And so you create two forms and you disable the form for that, or you uncheck the form for that specific uh, role so that they cannot access that employee salary. So this is where you can do it. And you can do the same for 
any form from transaction forms all the way to inventory detail forms. So that it just shows you all the available forms in the system and you can define whether they have access to it or not and whether that form is preferred for that role. So if you have multiple forms and you don't have the restriction of what form the employee can use because you may have two or three forms for sales orders for different things, but the employee can access all three, then you can say, well, they have access to all three, but I want for this role, the preferred form for bill payments to be this one. So whenever they create a new form is going to default to that form so they don't constantly have to be changing the form when they're entering a transaction. So this is done at the role level. Um, you can restrict searches uh, in the system. Again, you can, you know, you have all the searches here and you can restrict um, uh, what form, for what record type. Um, and then, um, for example, if I do a transaction, You can deform this, you can select the form, uh, you know, what, what the results, what the specific results form is for that, uh, what is the default list view for that specific transaction, uh, whether they can see it in the dashboard, whether they can see it and the, and, uh, you know, on the sub list and whether it runs restricted or not. So this is very advanced. We don't see a lot of customers getting to this stage, but you can restrict or give permissions to specific searches. So if this is a use case for you, this is something you can explore. And again, reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, here you can see users that have been assigned that role. So you can see it, you know, we, we, we show you before here on the, the managed users, but if, you, if you're in the, inside this role record, you can assign, you can see who has access to it and do they have login access. So, so you, have, you may have a lot of employee, old employee records that don't have access anymore, but have that role assigned. Uh, he will show up here without login access. Um, so there are some custom preferences you can set here uh, as far as, uh, you know, uh, things that you set up in the global preference that you can uh, default for that specific role. Uh, this is where you would define which specific preferences you want to customize for that role. So if you're a sales manager and you want to see the, uh, you know, um, calculated forecast as weighted, and you want every time I enter, I'm in a role of sales, I want that to be true, then I can set that preference, even though the preference may be set to false at, at an account level, I can set it to true at the role level. So you don't have to create workflows and, and or scripts to automate that. Right? So you can, you can define that here. Um, here, so you will define if they have a published dashboard, you'll see that here. And we talked about dashboards. Uh, we have a recording for how you can publish a dashboard to a role. This is where you would see what dashboard that role has defined. Uh, you can set up translation rules for this, for languages, uh, for that specific role. And then here, obviously, you can see the history of that role. Any changes that you may have done to that role are going to show up here. And then system notes, like, like always, you'll see them here. So that's sort of a first pass at the role and everything you can do with the role. Uh, there's a couple more things that I want to point out to when it comes to roles and permissions, and then we'll get to, to questions and answers that, that were submitted before, or I don't see any questions submitted yet, but we'll, we'll, we can get to those as well. Um, one of the things I wanted to, to touch on was, you know, when there's other permissions or the other ways that roles come into play. So if I'm looking at, um, for example, forms, and I'm looking at transaction forms, I'm just gonna go to a specific, you know, uh, credit memo form. You know, when you're creating a form, you can define in that form, uh, let's give it a second to load. When, you, um, when you're creating a form, uh, you can define in that form the roles for that form. Uh, again, we, we did it, we saw on the, on the role, how you can define a preferred form, but obviously then you, at that point, you have to go to every role to make that change. If you're creating a custom form, you can select 
in the custom form what roles are going to use that as a preferred form. So whenever they log in and go to that transaction or record type, their preferred form uh, is over here. Um, so that's one way the roles come into play on, on the creation of form. So sort of the power of permissions and roles for that. Obviously you can, you have to make sure that things tie out. Uh, if, you, if you disable a form for a specific role in the role, it might, that role may still show up here. Uh, so you may have to do some testing, but, but this is what, the way you would control that. The other, the other way that roles come into play is in fields. So if I'm creating fields, um, and I'll look at uh, you know, transaction body field, for example. And you know, I have a transaction body field that I created. You, you have the option of, you know, when you create the field, you have an access tab here where you can see by role, you can define whether a specific role, even though they have access to a form where that, where that field resides, you may say, well, for the accounting analyst role, this, for this field, you, they can only view it, uh, and you can do the same for, for safe searches. So I may not want them to edit that field on the specific form, even though they can access it, uh, or you can give them no access at all, um, or obviously you can give them edit access. Here's where you define the default access. So it goes from default, and then it looks at the, at the role itself, and will provide this level of access for that form. And you may want fields that you want it uh, not, not editable for a specific form, and you don't have to do that through workflow. Uh, you can also set, set up other restrictions by department, subsidiary, if, if you want to as well. <clears throat> um, lastly, it, it, when, it, for those of you that have customizations, if I'm doing a custom record, for example, um, custom record type, uh, you have the option of, on the custom record type, you look at any custom record type here. I see one that doesn't have, that is not locked. Nature of transaction codes. Within, within the custom record itself, you'll see a permissions link here. So this, uh, uh, so this is where I mentioned before, the access type, if there's no permissions, does this use the permissions list, uh, or you know, which is what we looked at on the role or required custom record entries permission, which will be setting it up here, where you can define what role has access to this record and the level, which is you know, view, create, edit, and all the different, you can create default forms, uh, for that record here on that custom record itself. So uh, another way that roles are coming to play and, and, and also when you look at things like scripts, workflows, uh, you can use roles to restrict which roles a, a, a workflow or a script runs for and which roles it, it doesn't run for. So <clears throat> that's uh, the prepared remarks. Uh, let me go to the questions and again, feel free to, if I've Miss something that you're interested in, uh, please uh, show me a question on the question and answer window. Um, so the first question was how to publish dashboards to end users of a role. Um, you know, we talked about dashboards in, in a previous session, but basically when, if you had a dashboard permission restriction and you wanna publish a, a dashboard to somebody, you, when you're, um, uh, when you come to this publish dashboard option, once you've defined and build your dashboard, you, you come here and this is where you would apply those roles that you uh, that plan, apply that dashboard to those specific roles. Just remember that the creator of the dashboard has to have the same role as, or sorry, center type as the person that you're, or the role you're publishing that dashboard to. Uh, and as a quick mention, an administrator role uh, is not a role that it can be edited. Um, so the, the it, it, I believe it uses the classic center type, but it, that cannot be changed. So you have to make sure that those center types uh, work. Um, couple more things before we get into the questions that I, I did want to permit, uh, show 
um, show um, that are valuable is a, if you come to company enable features, um, <clears throat> there's a couple of options under, under your company. If you have the administrator role, uh, you have access to this under the company tab. There's a couple of uh, new, uh, not new, but different restrictions that you can, you can set up. Um, so the first one is IP address rule. So you have the option in NetSuite to, if you click this, if you check this box, you have the option of restricting access to NetSuite from certain IP addresses. Uh, so we've had customers that say, well, for some roles uh, uh, or some employees even, don't allow them to access NetSuite outside of the office, right? Um, so you can, once you set this, you have to set up an, an IP address range within your account um, so that obviously you can access within your office, employee within your office, and you can then at the employee level, you can set up exceptions. So if you want an employee uh, to be able to access from home, you can uh, define that um, IP address at the employee level, or you can just say all and they can access from anywhere, right? So maybe you just want employees to be accessing from the office and from home. So those restrictions can be set. Um, the core administration permissions allow you to uh, set up uh, um, a, a role, allows you to set up a role that has core administration permissions and, and assign that role to employees. Instead of creating a custom role, uh, the hassle the score administration permissions, you can select this and will allow you to give non-administrators certain administration rights um, so that they can do a little bit more. We see a lot of clients that uh, use the administrator role for everything. Uh, you know, people, even people that are not administrators, CFOs, uh, controllers that, you know, implement the NetSuite and, and gave themselves the administrator role when they were implementing and they get used to it and they, they do everything under that role that is typically not recommended because of the power of the administrator role. Uh, um, so you can, you can create a true administrator and then a sort of a core administrator role permission for, for those specific uh, employees and assign that. Um, Going on, going back to the questions, the next question we had was how to best use roles and permissions to ensure proper internal controls in a small department. Hopefully we've answered sort of that. The idea is to, you have to really define what you want controls to be and you assign those roles. So for example, if you have a small department where you want people to be able to create journal entries but not approve them, if you have a workflow for journal entry approval, you can give the people that create the journal entry, the, ID, the option to create and edit a journal entry, but not to approve the journal entry. So even, you know, and then the, the manager, the option to approve the journal entry, uh, so that then you can, um, you can uh, have that distinction of, of, of responsibilities. Uh, if not, you can also always create roles uh, or workflows using role, roles as basis for the criteria to say what roles can create what roles can, can edit, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, next question was, how do you see customization for security impacting um, speed and reliability? So if you're customizing roles using native NetSuite, um, there's really no impact on speed and reliability. I mean, it's part of the architecture of NetSuite to be able to customize roles. If you use roles, uh, so instead of using the, the, the native functions of NetSuite, you're using workflows and scripts for, for, for to customize permissions. Uh, it will, you know, depending on the nature, the amount of those workflows and scripts, those, you may see some impact on, rela on, on performance, um, but typically you won't, it won't be noticeable, it'll be fractions of a second, but if, if they're way more complex then yeah, you may see some reliability. So, typically recommend that you use core NetSuite functionality to, to customize uh, whenever possible. Um, um, so uh, hopefully that, that answers that question. Um, the next question is uh, not, not directly related to roles, but uh, I think it's a good question is how can I lock certain fields in a form from being modified to other than a defined set of choices? 
So we talked about being able to log a field to be modified by a role, that's sort of a roles and security uh, uh, functionality. Uh, but if you have, I mean, uh, if you have a specific role or field, sorry, that you want to um, restrict to a list of values, uh, there's a couple, I mean, first of all, you have to create that list. And that is created here under customization list and list, list, and you can create a new list. So you give that list a name, for example, you know, um, um, you know, sample list. You give it an ID, sample list, and you give that ID that, that, that is values, value one, value two, value three, right? Um, and I save that list, very simple. So the next thing is when I create a field, Let's say I'm creating a new item field that I want to use that list instead of a text field. When you're creating the field, uh, sample this field, and you give it an ID, and you define where you want to provide a field. And instead of using a freeform text, you select, select uh, the type list record, and within the list record, you select the field, the list that you created. Um, and by doing this, whenever you go to a, a form that has that field, instead of having a freeform text, it will uh, have um, a list of values that you can select to. Then you have the option of whether, you know, uh, an employee can create more values to that list. That's a permission issue. When you go to the custom list itself, you have to give them permission to that list or not. But uh, but at least to be able to limit it, this is the way you do it. One thing to note is that if you have a field that has freeform text and you, um, you change it to a list of values, uh, Netsu is gonna give you a, a um, Netsu is gonna give you a, a message that the data will be deleted from that field. So it's not as easy to change, even if the, the in our experience, even if the, when there's a numerical field, you know, when you're changing from one currency, one form of number to another, it doesn't matter that much. But when you're changing from free from text to lists, a uh, typical network will delete those values, even if they're uh, typed exactly the same way. So a recommendation would be, if you do want to do that, you either create a new field and then do a backwards uh, update of that field uh, for, for the, and then disable the, inactivate the old field, or you do an export of all the data, you change the field, and then you still have to import the, the, the data for those, uh, uh, you know, for the historical records. So it's sort of the same effort. The question is whether you want two fields or one in the system, right? Um, so that's, that's something to, to ponder when you're doing that. The next question is um, about OAuth 2. Um, so OAuth 2, there's a little bit more complications. OAuth 2 is obviously a, a functionality to, to do authentication via integration. Uh, uh, I'll reach out to, to the person who submitted this question to see if, if we can, some, something we can handle offline. Integration is a little bit more complex. There's, there's more setups. You have to set up an integration application, then you have to set up the permissions for that integration application, et cetera. Uh, so we won't touch too much on that. The one thing that we will say is that there is a, a permission within the the permissions list where you the setup list where you have to set up that uh, OAuth permission for that role specifically to be able to integrate via that specific uh, using that protocol for authentication. Um, uh, and the final question that we have is: Is the cost of your system defined by the number of users, even minor users, such as entering time? So that's again not a role question, but the answer is yes. And Metro is user based uh, and uh, and NetSuite is, uh, uh, there is two types of levels of users. There's full access users and, and what's called an employee access users. So the employee center access user allows you to enter time, expenses and purchase orders only and it's a fraction of the cost as a full user. So uh, we'll reach out again to this person just in case there's any additional questions on this. Um, that's the end of our prepared remarks and the questions and answers that we had. Uh, I, I don't see any, any additional questions on the Q&A session. I'll hang out for a couple more minutes if anybody wants to ask questions. But again, I appreciate the, the time uh, and, and your participation in this webinar.
we will be doing uh, advanced financials in the next um, webinar next week. We'll be sending that invitation soon uh, and we'll display the topics that are there when we send that email out. Again, thank you very much for your time.